found my own identity, whatever that means. I can only make my own music, I can only yeah. do my own work. So like from the beginning, the focus was like, does this fulfill me? Does it make me happy? And then also, do I have something to offer through it? Like, can I do something good here? And if I can, then I can only do that if I focus on that, not on like people's I, opinions. I think that's absolutely fabulous. I think that deserves a round of applause because I think if we can all live like that, those so many pressures really don't mean anything. I think that's absolutely fabulous. I think I learned something here. Oh, you're sweet. <laughs> no, it doesn't mean I didn't feel it. It just yeah. means whenever it comes, I have to try and like oh, put that to the side because I'm not blind. I'm not deaf. I do hear the, yeah. you know, the stuff that but the way will you be said. With it. Is the truth. Yeah. yeah. So you have played at the most famous venues like the Sydney Opera House, Carnegie Hall. Also played with the most famous orchestras, the London Symphony mm. Orchestra, London Philharmonic, and also played with the most distinguished conductors mm. like Rubin Mehta and Christian Harvey. Were any of these a personal favorite? Well, Zubin Uncle, I'm biased because, yes. of course, like there's such a historical connection between him and my father, and then the fact that he's an Indian conductor that's achieved that level of, of global success is something really special and unique. So to play with him feels like a, a lovely connection, yeah. and also like a coming full circle after, yeah. you know, because my father played with him, and so that that does feel very special. Anushka has been a recipient of many, many, many awards. Not just, really. Yes, you have. <laughs> just to mention a few, six Grammy nominations. She was recognized as the youngest and first female recipient of a British House of Commons shield. Credit as Asian Hero by Time magazine, a Songline's Best Artist Award. More recently, she became one of the first five female composers to have been added to the UK A-level music syllabus. This is the first. Hmm. And... Uh, so can you tell us something about that? No. Um, <laughs> um, I, mean, I don't think any again, other Indian has been covered in the UK A-level syllabus. No, Gandhiji or something maybe. I don't know. I don't know. No, I, I haven't no, looked yeah. it up. I don't know. Um, I don't know. Again, all this stuff is tricky because it's like coming back to my earlier uh, response to your question about perception. Like I have no control over external perception. So like whether I get a nomination or an award. It's like a Grammy nomination is a great example because yeah. there's two months of time where I, I may get nominated for an award and all the papers go, she's been nominated, she's been nominated, this is so amazing, you're so lucky, you're such an icon, la 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 la. And then come February and not winning, she lost, she lost again, it's so sad, she must be so disappointed. And actually nothing in my life has changed. changed yeah. Like nothing has changed. It's just something happened and then something didn't happen outside of me that I had no part in and no control in. So to answer questions about that stuff, which isn't about stuff that I've done is hard because it's like, if someone recognizes my work, I'm honored and that's lovely. But it doesn't, it still doesn't change the, what are. I'm doing. Or, so the only focus I can have is on the work I do. So I try and just love on that. Yeah. Uh, Guruji was credited for taking classical music to the world. Whether it was his performance at Woodstock, or his collaboration with Yehudi Menon, or his association with George Harrison and the Beatles. Which really made Western world recognize and appreciate mm -hmm. our music. Today, in the eyes of many, Indian classical mu uh, music actually leads an impetus in India. Mm. What are your views on this? How can we encourage more of our own children mm. to take up our classical art forms? I don't, it's a big question, that one. I mean, uh, I don't know. It's uh, Lots of children are learning guitar, drums, yeah. piano. I mean, it's, it's hard because our population is so big, isn't it? So, yeah. it? so the numbers, when I go to like a play in a classical festival and I see so many kids who learn sitar learn, it seems like a lot of people are learning, you know, but, but maybe in context of the nation overall, it's not, it's not that many. So on one level, I find that it's very strong and actually very strong in it, and it has a strong life that's continuing. Um, but I don't think that's really indicated and represented in our popular culture. I mm -hmm. think that's where there's a disconnect, like the classical arts aren't really represented well enough in a kind of grand scheme of things. So what can we do? I don't better? know. I mean, the only parallel, like, I, I live in London and I come, so I, I do tour in the West a lot, and I see that, like, I mean, the, I think there are a lot of answers to that question, but one of the things I do see is that, like, it feels like, I don't like saying the West versus India, I mean, first of all, because yeah. there's no such thing as the West for so many <laughs> cities yeah. and countries and places, but, but when I do tour overall, I see that, like, in any given major cosmopolitan city, there will be a venue for every type of art form, you know? Um, there will be 
TV channels or radio channels for every type of art form. So there's like place for everybody and everything. So in, on the same night in one city, you have an opera house, you have a concert hall, you have a nightclub, you have a jazz cafe, you have... So music can exist in all of its different forms without necessarily being in competition with yeah. each other. Because if they were in competition with each other, obviously the most monetarily successful form of art will always get the space, which I think often is what happens here. If there's like one entertainment channel, well, that's not true, there's millions of millions. them. But they all make that choice of going for the biggest, most commercial form of art, you know. And so there isn't kind of the same representation for, for yeah. other forms. Um, I think that's one of the pieces, but I don't feel like I really have like the key answer of how to solve the problem. I think exposure is a big part of it. Like yeah. when it comes to how do you get your children to learn, yeah. I think um, I think, I think kids need to yeah. hear music. Yeah. Like Spikmake kids, is one organization yeah. which is doing a great job, but yeah. I think we need many more Spikmake. But it's also families. Like yeah. I think if yeah. like one of the things I see when I come back and I tour here is like a lot of younger people feel really intimidated by the classical music form because they don't understand it. You know, and, and, and I see it in the West as well. A lot of people feel really intimidated by opera, for example, because they don't know where to begin. You don't know how to start listening to it. You know, you feel like you haven't been educated and you feel self-conscious and then you stay away from it. And that happens here. So if people feel like they don't understand what they're listening to, they'll, they'll stay away from it, you know? And I think if, if people have been brought up like listening, just simply in the home, it doesn't mean they have to learn it, but just to hear it and feel familiar, then that means that intimidation isn't there. So I think it's a lot about the home as well. Yeah. The minute you said home and family, I looked at both my kids and they both oh, yeah? looked in opposite directions. <laughs> they refused to make eye contact. Are those me. your kids? Yeah. Kids Where? 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 Hi! <laughs> <laughs> there you are. <laughs> they grew up. They grew up. Yeah. Oh my god. Hi. <laughs> so being a professional musician, yeah. me. Yeah, you probably know better than I do yeah. here. Please, yeah. yeah. So ladies, just for your uh, reference, that is my father-in-law, Mr. Arun Bharatra. And he's a, he's a uh, uh, wonderful, very acclaimed sitar player and Pandit Ravi Shankar was his guru. Yeah, yeah. but he needs a clap for that. <laughs> yes oh. <laughs> he was in the orchestra instrumentalists in Carnatic music also. There's so many more female instrumentalists in Carnatic music. You have one here, one there in Hindustani music, and yet in the South I find it so much more common. You'll see women playing all instruments, whereas here it's generally just vocalists uh, can be men and women, and you'll see the rare female instrumentalist, you know? I don't know, I don't know why that is. <laughs> So it starts at childhood, basically. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Okay. So being a professional musician means traveling constantly, being away from home. How do you handle the challenges of managing the family, mm. maintaining a work-life balance? Uh, Anushka is married to Joe Wright, who's a very successful movie maker in his own right. He's made successful movies like Pride and Prejudice, Anna Karenina, and Pan. She has two bright, lively, energetic, absolutely adorable boys, Azubin and Mohan. 
must be under tremendous pressure to manage all this and keep a balance. I mean, this is, it's not a room, but it's a room full of women. And I just, I know you all know what it's like if you have kids and you have a family. I don't need to tell you whether it's difficult or not, because you know it's difficult. And I feel like, what do I feel like? I feel like it's a really dangerous question to answer the wrong way, because I feel like right from the beginning of when I had kids, I started getting a microphone thrust in my face going, how do you balance having kids and having a career? And it's like, I feel like it propagates this kind of weird illusion but that certain do people can do it all easily. Because it's easy to project someone like me onto a kind of image and go, look, she does it. She has kids. She has a successful career. Isn't that great? Meanwhile, other women will see that and go, oh my God, how come I'm struggling so much? Why is this so hard? You know. So when I get asked that question, I really try not to make it seem easier than it is because I think that does women a disservice, you know, because it's hard. It's really hard. And I feel like when I first had my first kid, I was in shock because I thought I grew up like in this kind of pretty feminist, like, and it's turned out it's not, but like, like pretty equal society, turns out it's not. But, um, you know, I, I kind of bought into this illusion that growing up I could have everything, you know. And then as soon as I had a kid, it was like, this is not the same. It's not the same for my husband as it is for me. What people expect of me versus what they expect of him yeah. is not the same and, and same how society is built in to support him versus me yeah. is not the same and therefore he can go off and do a film and people don't go is it really hard leaving your kids for three months how do you balance your career no one's asking him how he balances yeah. his career because they know i'm there at home making it happen right. you know whereas yeah. i'm when i'm on tour it's how do you balance your career because they know you know so things are still not set up in a way that it's as easy for women to have kids and have a career as it is for men and so I don't have an answer other than it's really hard and like one day at a time I try and make the best decision I try and keep a sense of priority in my life of like what's the most important thing and like obviously my kids are the most important thing and then like our collective help my health my well-being and then it's my career and I try and like make any decision that comes up like can you do this tour can you do this show I try and think of like what's going on for them right then is it okay if i leave for three days for example it's the beginning of a new school year then i shouldn't go away i shouldn't right. be gone because you never know what might be going on for him you know uh can you do this show in 2019 march oh okay zubin will be eight mo will be four what might be going on for him in march mo's birthday's in february so maybe zubin will be i mean it's like and then I have yeah. to think like that and go, okay, Joe, I have no idea. He might be making a film by then, so he'll be gone. Mom, can you be free? Can you commit to being in London in March? <laughs> then I'll say yes to this show. I mean, it, that's what it is. That's the reality. And I think when we sit there and go, how do you balance? It's like, I don't balance. I just work really hard to make sure my kids are okay, like we all do. You know, it's hard. It's hard. But, and it's you're not yeah. alone in this. I think yeah, I know it. I know it. I know it. I've struggled with this. I know it. Yeah, yeah, I know. And I'm sure a lot of you, like after you had your first kid, there was a kind of a rude awakening where you realized it was harder than you expected it to be. There was a, a rude awakening and there was a renewed appreciation for your own mother. Yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> Did you do all this? Yeah, yeah. Three times? Yeah, yeah. And also in my case, like extra yeah. fold because I wouldn't be able to tour if I couldn't keep calling yeah. her and saying, can yeah. you go and be with my kids while yeah. I tour, you know? So moms so, yeah. are the fallback. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Like I'll tell you, I, I was like I've just come. I've left London two nights ago to come and do this tour, right? So my husband's also releasing a film right now. So it's a really challenging little play, phase to make sure the kids are okay. So no offense to him, he's a great dad. You know, I'm not saying he's not, but it's just it's different. And like he's going to do his press junket. So he had like a horrible day of 12 hours of press before flying to New York. So he went to sleep and then he got up and he went. Whereas I packed for my tour and then I was on like the John Lewis website till midnight ordering my kids clothes to cause like one of them had just grown taller. So he has no trousers. So I'm like ordering trousers and then ordering a toilet seat for Mo because he's potty training. And like, I'm over here yeah. thinking, is he peeing on the floor right now? You know, like, like this is like, it's a different kind of like yeah. holding everything yeah, together, exactly. you know? <laughs> so, yeah. So no matter what we're doing outside, yeah. we're constantly You're still doing in everything the, yeah. at home. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Everything at home. <laughs> so that, that continues. Let me tell you, it doesn't get any easier. Great. Right. Yeah. I look forward to As that. As a kid, you know, there's exams and there's tuitions yeah, yeah, yeah. and there's SATs yeah. and it just yeah. never ends. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
Anushka, you've also authored a book, Bapi, The Love of My Life, a biogra biographical portrait of your father. Mm -hmm. Please share some interesting snippets of that from us. Well, it was, you know, I mean, the Rowley book started a series of, of biographies on iconic people written by their children or someone close to them. And, and I was the first one they approached asking if I'd write a book about my dad. And so it wasn't something I had set out necessarily planning on doing. But uh, when they asked, it seemed like a really lovely mm. opportunity. One, to kind of learn more about my father in context of writing about him. And two, because I love writing. I really love the spoken word. So outside of music, that's probably my favorite yeah. uh, form of expression. As you can tell, I like to talk. So, um, you so I also like also, to, I column. used to write a column yeah. also. So I like, well, it's just, it's, as a musician, like our, our, our influence is very abstract. Like when we write a piece of music, the way it influences a listener is very, abstract, you know, people have their own experience with music, and it's not necessarily your experience as the writer of the music, and I like that, but the written word, it's, it's straight, you know, this is my thought, this is my feeling, you know, and, and I enjoy that, so I, I, I relished the opportunity, and uh, it was really lovely, like, I just, I got to go back and really look through my dad's life again, and, like, I learned stuff about his childhood that I hadn't known, for example, um, and it just kind of colored him in mm. a, slightly differently than when you just have someone who's a parent. Uh, and, and yeah, I really enjoyed getting to do that. So it's a beautiful homage to him, no? Almost. Yeah, well, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> so music has many moods. What are the moods of Anushka Shankar? What is she like really as a person? If a friend of yours was to describe you today, what would they say? Ooh, um, I'm a good friend. Uh, so hopefully they'd say good <laughs> things. Um, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm really loyal. Um, like I'm really fiercely loyal.